Military reinforcement is expected to be sent to the town of Ago, where two people have been reportedly killed at Asante Achim Ago in the Ashanti region in a renewed clash that erupted between Fulani headsmen and local farmers. Daniel is deep on the ground. A regional security council shall respond appropriately to any fallout from these security operations. David Atia, 25, and another person uh, who is yet to be identified were said to have been shot dead at close range by a flanny headsman following brief exchanges. Farmers in the area say they have had cause to complain about the behavior of the flanny headsman. <laughs> Last week, MP for the area, Kwejo Ba Ajabang, advised residents of Agogo to do whatever they can to protect their farmlands. If any animal enters our farm, we will protect our farmlands. So what could be the trigger for the latest shootings in the area? Is it the MP's comments? Who is to blame for the violence? But why are we here even after Operation Cowleg? Is there any hope of peace between the Fulani headsmen and farmers in the Agogo area? Or should we expect more of these? This is today's big story. My name is Aishi Vine. The shooting has thrown the town into complete chaos. The farmer, David Atia, was reportedly working in his granite farm in the afternoon when he was allegedly shot by the Fulani who was keeping a herd of cattle. The Fulani headsman, who also was purportedly shot in the thigh by a native of Agogo in retaliation, but he survived the gun attack and is responding to treatment, according to an anonymous police source. Residents say this is what have had they have had to contend with all these years yesterday when i got to my farm cattle had invaded it so i pleaded with the headsman who was with them to move them because they were eating and destroying my crops but it fell on deaf ears i pleaded further that he would let me harvest my crops and allow the cattle back into the farm in the process, another headsman appeared, so I asked him to plead with his colleague on my behalf, but he also refused and asked me to leave my farm. He was armed with a gun like the other headsman, so I was afraid and I left. On my way out, I found that the cattle had destroyed a lot more crop than I thought. <laughs> David's body has since been retrieved from the bush while the police and community members have mounted a search for the body of the second person. People were shot, but uh, fortunately, uh, one, the, uh, one was not dead. The, the Fulani boy uh, didn't die. He was shot at the tide the left tire and some bullets also went to the right tire. So we pick him from a village called uh, uh, Abruanko, Abruanko, near Ensinyamiye, uh, a the very far distance place. In fact, even our vehicle couldn't access to the place. We have to uh, park our car somewhere and embark on walking. So we walk for quite a distance before we were able to to see the guy who was shot. Apparently, they thought he was dead, so they left him. But fortunately, when we went there, he was lying prostrate, and we picked him 
to the hospital, sent him to Konongo uh, government hospital. Then he was referred to Konfanache emergency hospital. Mm. So at the moment, they are there for surgery to remove the pellets that went to the ties mm. of the <coughs> of the Fulani boy, who is 18-year-old boy. Mm. What do we know about these shootings? How do you mean? I mean, uh, who shot them? Who are these victims? How it happened? The, what happened is that mostly uh, the Fulani people uh, send their, their cattle to graze in the farms of these people. And uh, when they get sometimes about 10 acres, 5 acres, you see that they graze the whole farm, corn farm, onion, and what have you. And you know, the farmers also believe that they've taken so much resources to put into this effort to ensure that this thing comes and they get some living income. But the Fulani herdsmen go there and feed on all these uh, crops. So they become infuriated and sometimes also take to a bit violence with them. Mm. So in this particular case, uh, who shot who? Is it a Fulani who shot uh, another The Fulani first person? case is Fulani a uh, man whose yet name is yet unknown. We are still looking for him, and I believe strongly that uh, we'll get him within the shortest possible time. Mm. Yeah, and he shot the full animal shot uh, a, a, a native by name uh, 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 David Abanga alias Atia. Mm. He shot him dead, and we have to turn the uh, the body to uh, Agogo Hospital for 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 autopsy. And for preservation as well. Mm -hmm. And the second one? And the second one, like I told you, it is a Guinea a native farmer who shot uh, at the Fulani. Meanwhile, Ashanti Regional Security Council seemed to blame the Member of Parliament for Asante Achim for the recent renewed killings at Agogo. Last week, Kwejo Ban Ajaman advised residents of Agogo to do whatever they can to protect their farmlands. The Ashanti Regional Minister Peter Anefi Mensa, after a RECSEC meeting today, says military reinforcements will be sent to the town. Police command to take all necessary steps to engage leadership of the various stakeholders of the conflict in the Agogo and other communities to bring the situation under control. It is one of these attempts that necessitated the invitation extended to the Honorable Member of Parliament and Mr. Osu Bemba to come in to assist the Regional Security Council in particular to have a lasting solution to this. So if the police actually invited or extended that invitation to honorable member of parliament and uh, Mr. Osu Benpa, it wasn't the police per se, but the police was acting on the decision taken by the regional security council. <coughs> Meanwhile, intelligence gathering is deep on the ground. A regional security council shall respond appropriately to any fallout from these security operations. Regional Security Council has also taken swift action to deal with any infraction of the law in the area. In fact, we have to note that in the course of performance of our duty as the Regional Security Council, we cannot whatever say that the foreign Tulani go, they are the target and the target is getting rid of them but not to allow people to harm them. We need to protect them also. So uh, we can listen to a security analyst, uh, Dr. Uh, Kwesi Enin, who is with the um, Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center, who spoke to us earlier on this issue. He believes that uh, there should be a way of bringing calm into that area. It's unfortunate. And I think it reflects the failure of our institutional mechanism first to understand the brewing of these process, its ramifications, and to nip it in the bud. And I think we've allowed it to fester and fester, and we've, we are now seeing 
the unfortunate result of this collective failure of our institutional mechanism. Hmm. Um, and, the, and its exploitation by different groups. Now, I remember that as far back as 2011, there was a court order which directed that these herdsmen be moved out of Dagogo Township. It looks as though that has not happened, and that's why we're seeing what we're seeing today. But how do we move from this point of having residents angry, wanting to attack the herdsmen, and the potential violence this can spark? What should be done at a time like this? Well, I think it's important that we separate the judgment from its lack of implementation. You see, because there are specific cases, land cases, that have been judged much longer than 2011, for which there's no compliance. So this is not a full any reluctance to comply with a court order. Once more, it reflects the, our failure of our institutional mechanism. But, you see, part of it also is that we have not, as Ghanaians and the state of Ghana, fulfilled its obligations under ECOWAS's regulations on transhumans. The regulation that says we've got to distinguish between Ghanaian Fulani and the migratory Fulani and the, and the things that we need to do for the migratory ones and even those who have settled on the land. And once more, we have failed. Then we've got to ask ourselves what institutions and which institutions and individuals failed to deliver. And I think we are not asking that question. So then, I need to ask you then, which institutions are failed in this regard, Dr. Enin? Well, I think those who sit on the resect and the dissect have failed this thing, plus uh, preventive action. They failed in that sense, because they are the people, and there's about 14 or so state security agencies, and they ought to do the early warning, and then pass on the details to others to do the preventive work. And to fail so dramatically, consistently over time, to now leading to chiefs, market women, youth, and others using the liberal xenophobic language against the minority group is improper. Now, we know already that in yes. the past there have been some operations that have been carried out uh, by the security services. One I can remember is Operation Cowleg. Yes. Do you think that project was not properly implemented or it was just a wrong start for us and that's why we could not sustain well, it? Well, no, we tend to use curfews, up military stroke police interventions domestically as a stopgap measure. We never go back to say, look, we've calmed the initial situation, the tensions are okay, can we sit down with those who lead in our community and the contesting party to, to have a conversation? Because we can sweep things under the carpet, these conflicts over time have become intractable so that there are multiple mythologies, discourses, and that disaggregating the reality has almost become an impossibility. But we must, as Ghanaians, interested in a peaceful country, get to the table and get the interested parties. You see, because this is not just about dealing with some migrant. You see, the political economic elite of West Africa are full of it. So this has potential geopolitical implications. You see, that we need to ensure that the manner in which we respond to and react to this challenge is done in a, in a way that doesn't create even further problems for us. Okay. But we also look at Ghana, and that is why I'm appealing for some understanding. That was an earlier interview uh, with uh, my colleague Francis Aban. We can do uh, some more analysis because uh, Wing Commander Patrick Sogojo retired is on the phone line. Good evening to you. Thanks for joining us on today's big story. Hello, Commander. Good evening to you. How are you doing? At whose doorstep should we lay the blame for the latest violence? I believe this Fulani syndrome has been with us for a long time. 
But the current type of polanis we have are different from those in heart of ages past. The Fulanis we had didn't engage in rape, they didn't engage in armed robbery, um, carjacking, and etc. But these are a different breed. But the question is that you can't enter anybody's borders and with impunity. Kill them, maim them, rape their women, their wives, and go court free. Well, I think the, the security of the nation is paramount, and um, they must find a way to deal with it. When Commander, I'll have you hold and go on to the other phone line and speak with Lava Firm's uh, Rasta Sasari, who's been monitoring uh, affairs in Agogo. Good evening, Rastos. Uh, what, what's the latest from Agogo? Well, the latest is that as we were leaving uh, the town, uh, we saw a uh, reinforcement of uh, patrol teams, both military and police armed. Um, we saw about three uh, patrol vehicles entering the town and some in front of uh, the uh, district office. And that is what is going to happen in Ireland uh, within the next uh, one month. Uh, they are going to beef up security. Uh, in the uh, bush to ensure that the Fulani herdsmen are pushed at bay. But then the uh, chiefs and people are quite skeptical about this tactic because it's been done before. We, we've had Operation Cowleg. Uh, we brought in military and police personnel. And if you look at the vast area of the Agogo land, when we're talking about villages that are miles apart and you know, we have planes that you could see far ahead. And so if you say you are keeping military men, armed men, in the bushes for, uh, say, one month, we are talking about the expenses, uh, what they are going to eat and all that. And so there are people who are a bit skeptical about whether this will work and it's not just like any other business that has been done over the years to try and quell this. And there are people who also believe that these cattle belong to high-powered people within our society, Ghanaians for that matter, uh, who could call the shots. And so uh, even if you want to really fight this uh, menace, um, it doesn't get anywhere because somebody will be fighting the fight, uh, the whole uh, thing behind the scenes. And so currently as we speak, uh, the whole town is talking about the Fulani people. Because there's no job in the town. The only job you have in Agogo is farming. Plantain, cassava, lettuce, cabbages, that is what they feed on. And so if they cannot get to the farm, then the youth and the people are now saying that they will have to arm themselves and take the fight to the Fulani people in the bush. What can you say about relation to each other? How are they relating to each other right now? With reaction to where uh, you are referring to the Fulanis and the indigents? Yes. How is their relationship like right now? But that is a very complex kind of relationship, I must say, because um, it was prayer, prayers uh, this evening. I was there close to a mosque, and I saw some people of Fulani descent coming from the uh, mosque, praying together with the indigents. And I saw Fulani women who live among the natives of Agogo. And in fact, I also know of Fulani people who have gotten married to um, the Agogo indigents as well and giving birth to children who are now part of the society. Now we are talking about other Fulani people who are in the bush and are having the notion of killing other people in the town. And so it's a complex kind of relationship that they do have there. When they go into the bush, and the cattle are eating their uh, produce is a different ball game altogether. But well, when many you come thanks. To the town and you see them uh, mingling and socializing with other Fulani people, that's also a different kind of relationship altogether. Erastos, many thanks for uh, the update. Uh, we hope to call you in our subsequent bulletin for <laughs> more. Uh, on the other phone line uh, is Wing Commander Patrick Sobojo, retired. Good evening. And, and uh, I'm coming back to you. Uh, uh, wing commander. Uh, Operation Cowleg was supposed to close the curtains on this matter. Why are we still here even after uh, the Operation Cowleg executed by the security agencies? 
Well, I believe the Raptors have given a very good, uh, vivid um, impression of what is happening on the ground. You see, Operation Kale was set and destroyed. Ship. And you can't mean have military security men living in the bush perpetually. It's going to drain the economy. So immediately, uh, what I think should happen is set and destroy. Then the long-term measures should be taken. Uh, maybe I recommend that you create a corridor from which the full army men can come with their cattle and then go back. Right. As I said, the kingdom of Fulani now stretches all the way from Mali and ends up on top of Chad. So I'm saying the different group of Fulani, those who've been here over the years, are much more sober. The new ones coming are troublesome. So they should sit down and find a corridor where they can come in and go. And this is happening because in the olden days, the Volta Lake are not pulling up. But now the Volta Lake is big and the cattle will find any green to eat. But that doesn't mean if you bring your cattle to come and graze, it should come and display this kind of impudence and punity in some of these countries. Erastus so we must sit and find... Wing Commander, Erastus has painted a picture of uh, cross marriage and that uh, in, in the situation where the indigents have um, gotten married to some Fulani men or yeah, some Fulani men true. have it's... married, uh, some Fulani women have married uh, Ghanaian men and have given birth to some children. And so, how does peace prevail in this, uh, I mean, such an environment? We cannot say we should drive all of these people away because they've now become part of us. How how does peace prevail in such an environment? Well, well one has to understand the, the logic of the Fulani and the capital. They treat them as human beings. And the Fulani man is ready to die for capital, while well, maybe a Ghanaian won't do it. And I said, most of them had also come in much, much earlier. And they'd be more or less Ghanaian, and I see there's a word like that. They felt so quietly. But if you look at this, the new breed of them who are coming, who are indulging in armed robbery, rape, and arrest, it's, it's a different ballgame. So we should also engage those who are here married with their children and from the court and talk among themselves and find a way others to educate them that Ghana is a peaceful country. And those who are married should be an example to the new ones who are coming. But at the same time, we should find a corridor, like I'm repeating. So they bring their cattle into Greece and they take them back. Well, many thanks to you. Wing Commander Patrick Sobojo retired. Uh, we're really grateful for your time. We can all listen to uh, the chief of the Fulanis in that area who's been speaking and explaining the side of the Fulanis. We are aware of what is going on and we've been talking to our people on the ground over there. And when you say you're talking to them, what exactly does that mean? What have you been telling them? We've been advising them to be restrained, to restrain themselves from engaging themselves in any act of violence or any you know, uh, breaking of the law. Okay. And as much as you've been speaking to them about what they should do not to break the law, what have they also been telling you about their experiences in our goal? Yes, the experience is, it is very, very worrisome because they live in fear. They feel like uh, their lives are in danger because somebody has declared war against them. So that is the situation. And so as I speak to you right now, we are preparing to summon a meeting with them, and then we'll see how we'll be able to resolve the issue once or for. Some time ago, we tried our best, but I think we are back to zero. Okay. Now, for the ones you've spoken to specifically in Agogo, do you know where they are right now? In fact, uh, I cannot say I know where they are, but I know they are not at the place where they used to be. They were relocated ever since the court order. They were relocated to 
a different area, and that one also has its problem. Okay, and I'm asking that question, sir, because just a few seconds ago, you said you have spoken to the people in Agogo, and they tell you that things are difficult for them, they are moving. Where are they moving to? No, I'm not saying they are moving to a place, but what I'm saying is that they feel their lives is in danger. They are being threatened. That's what I said. What about their activities in terms of um, their relations with the people in Nagogo? We've had a case reportedly of uh, somebody who owns a farmland who was shot by a Fulani headsman. Yeah, I also heard about that. I'm still trying to make my inquiries and uh, I'm not getting through the, the, my contact person. So, so I don't have up to date of that about that information. So what are your plans now at this point? We know one person is there, another is in critical condition. You are the chief for uh, the Fulanese in Ghana. What are you going to do to ensure that we don't see more of these incidents happen in the country? Yes, that's what I said earlier that we are planning to organize a meeting and then try to bring all of them down and then we'll see how best we all put our heads together see how we can resolve the issue once and for all. Now, how soon will this meeting happen? Yes, we are preparing. You know, uh, you have to organize yourself well. We are uh, some people coming all over. And even not only the Agogo people, because this thing is happening across the country. You hear and that was Chief Mohammed Bingle, Chief of Fulanese in Ghana, in an earlier interview with my colleague Francis Aban. So if you just joined us, it's simple. Two people were shot in Agogo uh, last night, and one of them is dead. One of them is in critical condition. And we're told it was an exchange between uh, indigenous of Agogo and Fulani headsmen in that area. And we're told that there will soon be a meeting. Uh, I know the indigenous are having their meeting. Fulani chief says he'll soon meet his people and ensure there is peace in that area. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. This is today's big story. Many thanks for watching.